Okay. Um, so this is going to be an introduction to machine learning on larger than memory data sets. Um, so when you're starting out um, doing machine learning or your company has relatively small data sets, you're usually able to get away with going on one machine, um, doing everything in RAM. But what happens when you start exceeding that, uh, those limitations? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, there's going to be a lot of information that, we're gonna, that I'm going to be giving to you. Um, so um, feel free to uh, ask any questions, uh, use the Q&A section um, so that I can see them at the end. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started here. So the first thing, um, just to uh, give you all an overview of what we're gonna be talking about, um, we're gonna first talk about memory constraints. Um, that is sort of the first thing that you have to deal with when you're dealing with these larger data sets. So that's gonna be just getting the data set into RAM itself. Um, after that, we're gonna talk a little bit about speed constraints. So what to do when your analyses are now taking an awful long time because your data is large. Um, and sort of under that, we're gonna be talking about parallel computing, parallel cluster computing, and then we're gonna review a modeling example. Now, again, this is sort of an overview. Um, so we're gonna give you just some strategies to go over each one of these discussion points. Um, and then hopefully we'll have um, some more information as we get some questions. So the first thing that we're going to do, though, is we're going to define some key terms. And that's going to start with, what do I mean by small, medium, and big data? Um, so small data, uh, for me, is anything that fits in Excel, so less than 1 million rows. Um, again, you could probably uh, disagree with any one of these terms, but this is what we're going to use for the purposes of our presentation. Um, medium data is sort of a nice, happy place for doing coding. Um, that's when everything fits into RAM. So if you're used to using pandas, um, then that's going to be where a lot of your, your analyses are going to go. And then we move on to big data. Um, and that's going to be the focus of uh, this particular talk. And that could be a variety of things. The first one um, that you'll have to deal with is large volumes. Um, so things over uh, anything that's larger than will fit into RAM. Um, it could be a large variety of data. So things like images or text or sound, um, that sort of thing. Or it could be coming in really quickly. Um, so for instance, if you're getting sensor data and you need to process it right away, um, then you might need to use different approaches uh, than you would if you're just getting relatively static data. So first thing we're going to do, um, we're going to have a little bit of a poll um, and we're going to, I just want to know kind of what data you typically work in in your day to day. Is that small data? So that fits in Excel, medium data fits into RAM or big data um, so that, um, you know, it's not going to apply to either one of those or maybe some of each. Um, so while we're waiting for you to answer that particular poll, um, I'm just going to give a quick plug out, uh, a quick shout out to uh, Saturn Cloud, um, who's putting on this webinar. Uh, Saturn Cloud is a cloud data platform for data science, um, and it allows you to basically switch from developing on your single laptop and move into the cloud seamlessly. Um, you can use any number of systems, uh, up to four terabytes of RAM and over 100 core machines are, um, are possible. Um, you can host dashboards, APIs, schedule jobs, um, and really importantly, you can try it out for free for 30 hours a month um, with a 64 gigabyte uh, system or with the GPU or with DAS clusters. Um, so that's really good. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at the poll. So it looks like most of you are dealing with relatively medium data sets, which is fantastic for this um, particular uh, webinar. So we're going to talk about how to move on from those into the larger data sets. So the first thing that you're going to deal with when you're moving into these larger data sets are memory constraints. Um, these are kind of tricky to figure out sometimes. Uh, oftentimes, all you'll get is an error message saying the kernel is restarting if you're working in Jupyter, or you might get a CUDA memory error or something like that. Um, but basically, what you're running into is that you've tried to put more information into RAM than will actually fit in the machine. Uh, so we'll have a variety of different um, strategies for dealing with this. Um, the first one is going to be buying your way out. So essentially buying a larger machine. Uh, the second one is going to be making your data smaller so that it'll actually fit in RAM. And then the third one, which is what most frameworks to use, is going to be chunking your data into smaller bits, analyzing them, and then putting them back together into something that'll actually fit into RAM. So the first thing we're going to talk about is buying your way out. 
Um, and this is just simply it pays off to get a bigger system. Um, so when particularly this works really well in cloud computing, um, if you're working on your laptop, um, you can absolutely go out and buy more memory. Um, there's probably a limit to that in terms of what your system can handle, but cloud providers like Saturn Cloud make this pretty seamless. So you can just select a different type of machine um, and go from 16 gigabytes of RAM to 64 gigabytes of RAM with little to no downtime. Um, just as an example of why this sometimes pays off, um, you've got to think about your time as valuable. So if you're particularly working for a company and your pay rate is $50 an hour, and instead of moving from a 16 gigabyte of RAM computer uh, to a 64 gigabyte of RAM computer, uh, which is only going to cost you about 61 cents an hour, you spend five hours trying to optimize your code, then you're going to be spending an awful lot of of your company's money and time trying to do something that would be far easier and cheaper uh, to just turn up the, uh, the system. Now, it always comes down to what is the worst case that could happen here. Um, and as you can see, even in the worst case for this particular example, we're, you're still saving money um, based upon your hourly rate. Um, this was something that was really hard for me to come to terms with as a starting data scientist. Um, because I've been working on side projects, um, you know, or tutorials, that sort of thing to start with, the cost was a major thing to keep into consideration. Um, but as I've sort of matured and had a scientist, I realized that the compute time is definitely, or sorry, the compute cost is definitely worth um, saving some time. Um, so when does this approach not work? Well, again, the side projects is not fantastic for because you will be paying a little bit more for it. Um, but the other part is going to be when you reach the limits of your machine options. Now, this will take an awful long time uh, for most data sets. Uh, for instance, at Saturn Cloud, you can use up to a four terabyte machine. Um, so four terabytes of RAM, that will fit an awful lot of data. Um, and so there will be a time probably when you reach the limits of that machine, but try to, you know, it's definitely an option to move up in machines um, before you move on to uh, anything else. So the next thing that we're going to talk about in terms of memory constraints is going to be making your data smaller. So there are three sort of subcategories of this. Um, you can sample your data, so just get a little piece of the data. You can summarize your data, so you can you know, put some aggregate statistics on it, or you can just use the memory more efficiently. And we'll talk about each one of these um, in just a moment. So the first thing, and this is something that I use all the time, is sampling your data. Um, so when you're doing this, instead of taking a 100 million row data set, you could take, let's say, 20 million rows out of it, do some analysis on it, and see if it works. Um, this is a fantastic way to do sort of minimum viable products. Um, so making sure that your analysis is going to actually go somewhere before you do the analysis itself. Um, there's a couple of methods for sampling your data. Uh, the one that I use most often is actually just buying a bigger system. So um, turning, uh, like, so going to a cloud computing um, resource, turning on 128 gigabytes of RAM or something like that, sampling the data, turning off that particular system after I save the data somewhere, and then using a smaller system for the rest of the analysis. Um, this works really well and um, is something that I would recommend you try doing. Um, Oftentimes, you're only using that larger system for 15 minutes or so while you're getting a sample of the data, and then you can move to the smaller machine to do the rest of the analysis. Um, the other way to do it is to sample the data without loading it all into memory. Uh, this can sometimes be a little bit tricky because um, what you think is not um, putting things into memory is actually moving the entire data set into memory. But if you're doing it carefully, this will work uh, fine. Um, so the first one is you could read the data line by line, um, do whatever you need to to that line, and then save it somewhere else. Um, this can work um, for certain workloads, but it's not fantastic for getting a true sample of your data. Um, you could read only certain columns. Um, so only certain columns may be important. Um, and so then you can just use those. You could read a subset of the rows. So for instance, defining a random, uh, uh, some random values, taking those random rows out of a table and only reading those in. Or you can, if you have a list of files, read only some of the files in. Um, so why does this work? Well, 
a lot of times you can preserve the relationships of the larger data set in the smaller sample of the data. So although you're only using, let's say, a million rows of a 10 million row data set, if the relationships apply in that smaller data set, then you can still run a model on it and see if it'll work. Um, this also fixes both speed and memory issues. So because you're using smaller data overall, um, you don't have the memory issues, but you also don't have um, you, the analysis will also run faster. Now, this approach doesn't work for certain data sets when, for instance, there's a rare event. So if you have a one in a million event, but you're only taking a million rows and that event doesn't happen in those million rows, um, then you don't have a functional model. And so you might have to rethink how you're sampling. Now, the next bit about making your data smaller is summarizing your data. Uh, this is, again, something that I use all the time um, because it has a variety of, of positives here. Um, first, a couple of methods that you can do here uh, that you can apply to this. Um, principal component analysis um, is a great one. Um, manual and automatic feature engineering. Um, so manual feature engineering is just making new features. Um, automatic is something that I use a lot of time using frameworks like Feature Tools or TS Fresh. Um, and those allow you to generate a whole bunch of features on the raw data without doing an awful lot of work. Um, oftentimes, this, res this representation retains the meaning of the data without actually having all the data in there, um, which allows you to make the data smaller, runs faster, um, all those benefits. You can also inject some of your subject area knowledge, which is a fantastic benefit here. Um, so for instance, if you're dealing with stock market data, you can start putting in some technical indicators um, or other domain knowledge that you have um, that can make the, the model a little bit more quote unquote intelligent about what it's looking at. Now, this doesn't always work with every single uh, data set. Images can be tricky here, um, particularly if you can't uh, resize them or something like that. Um, but for an awful lot of data sets, this is a great way to work, particularly for, data, uh, for tabular data sets. And then lastly, under making the data smaller, we're going to talk about using memory efficiently. Um, you should pretty much just always do this. Um, specifying data types, for instance, when you're loading in a CSV, is really easy to do and has a lot of benefits. It uh, is faster and more memory efficient. Um, or you can do something like uh, reducing precision when you no longer need it. Um, so if you're doing a calculation um, and all of a sudden all of your integers are no longer uh, super long, they're all small, then you can reduce precision to that smaller integer type and you'll save an awful lot of memory. Um, this doesn't work all the time, however, um, when you require that precision or um, you know, the, the uh, memory needs to be there uh, for that particular data type. Or um, I run into this a fair amount of, uh, of times is when libraries automatically convert something back to a larger data type. Uh, SKLearn had this problem for a while and it may still, um, I haven't uh, used it um, frequently um, recently, but it would, it would take your uh, float 32s and convert them all back to float 64s. Um, so anything that you were doing in order to reduce your memory was just kind of moot um, when you actually applied the framework. And then obviously when your data set is too big, if you have a data set that is a thousand times the RAM that will fit in your machine, reducing the data types uh, or using specific data types is probably not gonna solve the problem. I still say this is an approach that you should take because even in this thousand times RAM situation, if you can have the memory requirements, uh, that means that you can apply um, different, or it, it makes it that much easier to apply other approaches. So as an overview, um, making your data smaller pretty much always guarantees quick wins. Um, it's comparatively easy to do uh, and quick to implement. Um, it also fixes speed issues. And then most importantly, it allows for quick iteration of models. So if you're making a model um, and you can do it in a couple of seconds just to test to see if the data is gonna result in anything that is useful, um, then you're gonna be in a much better situation when you actually apply the rest of the data um, or are dealing with um, a larger data set in the future. And then last for dealing with memory constraints, um, and this is going to kind of move us on to dealing with speed constraints, is analyzing your data in chunks. And so this is sometimes called split, apply, combine, um, something like that. And what you're doing is you're taking a larger data set, putting it into small chunks, 
and doing an analysis on each one of those. So in this case, it's a sum. So we're taking three and four and it adds up to seven and then combining those together at the end. Now you can do this manually. Um, so um, take this larger data set, take in a subsample of it, do some analysis and then move on from there. Or you can use a framework. And this is basically the approach that frameworks use uh, in, in the background in order to do um, larger uh, uh, data sizes. So if you're using something like Dask or Ray or uh, Spark, this is what's happening in the background. It's taking your larger data set, turning it into chunks, and then uh, doing the analysis on each one of those chunks and then combining it in the end. Now, the idea here is that although each this larger data set is too big for RAM, each one of these chunks will fit into RAM, and then the end result will hopefully also fit into RAM, although you can deal with situations where that doesn't apply. So when you're analyzing your data set in chunks, there's a couple methods. Um, group by apply uh, using fur, that sort of, or per um, for R is fantastic. Um, also using something like Dask in Python um, makes this a relatively seamless uh, transition into this uh, chunk data set versus a, um, a whole data set. Um, this approach works because it can handle basically any size data set. So instead of, um, or you can go up to billions of rows, analyze it in small little bits, and uh, then combine it into something that's, um, that's usable for your model or doing the modeling on each one of those little bits. Um, you typically don't experience a penalty to accuracy or performance when you're doing this particular, uh, when you're using this particular approach. Um, but um, it can happen occasionally. Um, I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's usually not uh, too big of a deal. And then most importantly, which will bring us on to the speed considerations, you can parallelize the calculations. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, this approach, again, doesn't work in uh, comparatively few situations. Um, so again, uh, this is uh, doing it manually uh, can be a little tedious, but it's definitely a way to do it. But using a framework that does it automatically is a fantastic option. So now that we've talked a little bit about the memory constraints and how to deal with those, um, we're gonna talk about speed constraints, which would be the next thing that you, you deal with. So now that everything will fit into the RAM of one or multiple machines, um, everything you're gonna to have to deal with the, the speed um, sort of detriment that you've created by making, that, um, by making that happen. So if you're dealing with huge data sets, it's just gonna take a while to analyze them. So how do we deal with that, uh, that particular problem? Well, the first thing we can do is optimize your code. Um, the second thing is use some just-in-time compilation. Um, and then lastly, which is the most important one, is we can parallelize the code. Um, the first two are, um, I've included in here and we'll go over very briefly, but we're gonna spend most of the time talking about parallelization um, and we'll go from there. So the first thing to think about with speed constraints is when do you actually want to optimize? So this is from XKCD um, and this is a table that I have up on my wall actually um, that talks about how long you can work making something more efficient before spending more time than you actually save. Um, this is something that we see that I think is really valuable to take into account um, because particularly if you're doing something only once, it may not be worth the, you know, let's say a couple of minutes time saving um, in order to do that task if it takes you an hour to do the optimization. Um, so keep this in mind. Um, my typical um, threshold for how long it takes something if I'm only doing it once before I kind of think about doing some optimization is about an hour. So if you run into a, a loop, for instance, that's going to take about an hour to run, um, then it's usually time to start thinking about making that loop run a little bit faster. So the first thing you can do um, is optimize your code. Now, I'm going to talk about this, but I wouldn't spend too much time on this particular approach. Um, premature optimization is uh, not really a great idea. Usually you can spend your time more efficiently doing something like adding uh, tests or making your code more readable. But um, as you get sort of more, uh, as you get more and more experience, you might find that your code is a little bit more optimized as you write it the first time. So just a couple of things to think about here, avoid nested loops, use vectorization when possible, um, all those sort of um, standard 
uh, approaches to making your code a little bit more uh, run a little bit more quickly. Um, this allows you to reduce the number of computations or increase the parallelization of these computations. But if you spend too much time doing it, um, it's going to uh, it's not going to be necessarily worth it. And then it can also make it more difficult to debug or for other developers to contribute. So use this sparingly um, and only when necessary, basically. The second one, um, it, uh, the second solution to speed constraints is going to be used using something like just-in-time compilation. Um, and so this is essentially taking a higher level language, so like Python and R, and turning it into a lower level language, uh, so like C or assembly or something like that. Um, this can yield incredible results, but also can be really frustrating. Um, so if you are, for instance, um, doing something uh, doing a calculation uh, over and over and over and over again, this can really speed things up. Um, it can also come with confusing error messages and um, some other artifacts that you may not really be able to debug easily. Um, so this is not something that I recommend you next, uh, necessarily go and uh, start out with. Um, but if you have an established pipeline, for instance, and you know that there's a particular bottleneck um, that needs to be addressed, then this can really uh, yield some incredible results. Um, so a couple of methods you can use, uh, this is not an uh, exhaustive list, but like something like Numba or uh, Bodo AI uh, is a relative newcomer, but will compile Python code um, or compiler for R. Um, and then this, this works great again, but when you're doing something only once, this can be a problem in terms of the overall time that it'll take to do it. Um, so again, if you're doing it over and over and over again, um, this will probably be worth it. But if you're only doing it once, it takes a little bit of time to compile the code the first time. So it'll take a little bit of, of time to take it from Python code and turn it into uh, C code. Um, and that time for compilation uh, means that you're adding that onto whatever the runtime of the code is. And so if you're not iterating multiple times here, then uh, that can overwhelm the overall um, wall uh, clock time of the, the code running. And then there are also certain times when the, the code just can't be compiled properly. So it will revert back to Python or R. So you'll have done some work and it won't necessarily give you any benefit. So now that we've given a couple of options on um, dealing with speed constraints, we're going to talk about the main um, the main option that you have for making things run faster, and that is parallel computing. So when you're parallelizing computations, essentially what you're doing is you're just doing multiple parts of the computation simultaneously, uh, and then pulling them all back together in the end. Um, once you know that particular little part is done. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different methods to do this. Most frameworks that you run into, um, like sklearn, uh, will do this automatically in the, back end, uh, the background. So uh, that's fantastic. But if you're looking to do it uh, manually, you can use something like future for R uh, or multiprocessing for Python. Um, those will allow you to send a function directly to a separate thread or process. Um, and then get the result back. You can also do something like group by apply using dask arrays or data frames or fur uh, for R, which will all be parallelized on the background. Or uh, in sort of the more uh, advanced uh, frameworks, you can use something like uh, graphs in the background. And so you can see here at the bottom right, um, there's a targets graph. And if you can see, there's multiple stacked steps here. Those can all be done at the same time. And then the results of those moved on to another step. Um, but this will allow you to use multiple cores all at the same time without, um, without any detriment to the, the overall calculation. The next place that you can parallelize um, beyond the CPU is using a GPU. Um, so a CPU, when you're parallelizing, you're basically taking um, going from a single core to, let's say, the four or eight cores of your machine. Um, and that's fantastic and will result in definite speed ups. But um, one of the things that we've, you know, they found um, was that the linear algebra done for graphics work is also great for other linear algebra problems. So NVIDIA released something called CUDA, which allowed you to basically access uh, these parallel cores in the GPU. 
and then build some frameworks on top of that, like Rapids, which allow uh, access accessing those a lot or accessing those cores a lot um, a lot easier. Um, so this results in some really massive parallelization if the workload is suited. Um, so for instance, for machine learning, um, this can be a real advantage. So you can uh, speed up your code um, multiple times um, by going from a CPU to a GPU. Um, but I recommend that you're using a framework, um, something like Rapids or PyTorch or TensorFlow um, in order to do um, this particular calculation. Um, oftentimes when you're trying to do it just in raw CUDA, um, then you're gonna run into problems. So why does parallelization work? Well, basically you're splitting it into big a big problem into small problems and then running those all at the same time. Um, it allows more workers to work on the problem. So your overall, so the calculations may take the same amount of time for the computer, but for you, the result is gonna come back uh, much faster. Um, the GPUs have incredible acceleration for certain workloads. So if you can get it to work on a GPU, that'll have a major benefit in terms of speed. And then also, as I was saying, this approach is already implemented in libraries um, like sklearn um, or any of the frameworks that we'll talk about next. Um, so you don't really have to make any changes to your code in order to have this uh, work for you. Um, this approach doesn't work when a few tasks dominate. So if you think about um, for instance, the above graph here. If, for instance, defining the model, which it shouldn't, but let's say that defining the model takes uh, an exorbitant amount of time, then the rest of the processors are going to be waiting for that to happen before they can do anything else in the calculation. So you have to take a look at the critical path and make sure that nothing on there is overall dominating the, the, the calculations. So when you're parallelizing your code, you're essentially given then two options. The one is to do it on a single node. So that's on your laptop, on a single server, um, using GPUs or more CPU cores. And then the other alternative is to use a multi-node framework. Um, so that's going up to multiple computers all working on the same problem at the same time and then bringing it back into your local machine. Um, so while we're talking about that, I have a quick poll, um, and that's how long should you remain in single node? For as long as you can, as long as you can, both A and B or all of the above. Um, I think it should be pretty clear here that you should retain, uh, remain in single node for as long as you can. Um, there's a bunch of different reasons for this, but the two primary ones are speed, um, it's just going to be faster and ease of use because it's what you're used to. So in terms of speed, um, when you're working with multiple machines, they're going to have to communicate with each other. And so that communication can really slow down the overall, um, the overall calculation uh, because you have to wait for whatever the bandwidth is between the machines. Um, and then the second one is uh, debugging and um, making sure that the code runs on multiple machines can be a, a huge hassle um, if you're not using the correct framework or if you are using infrastructure that you have to build in the background. So when you actually get to a situation, however, when you have to move beyond the single node machines, um, what do you do? Um, and how do we get into parallel cluster computing? Well. The first thing is to make sure that you're applying a framework to make this happen. Uh, don't try to do it manually. Um, you can, but it's often just nothing but headaches. Um, so use a framework like Dask, use a framework like Spark, um, like GBM, uh, something like that, that have built in uh, cluster computing uh, backends. Now, these the, the best bit about these frameworks is there's often little changes that you need to do in order to make basic workloads work or go from a single node machine to a cluster node machine. So for instance, for Dask, um, all you need to do is change the uh, from a local cluster to a distributed cluster, and you'll be working on multiple machines um, instead of your single machine. Um, so if you're using the right framework and um, and it has that built in, uh, this can be relatively seamless. You will still run into the problems that you have sometimes with uh, debugging and communication overhead, but we'll talk about those in a second. Um, one of the things to remember when you were 
dealing with these uh, particular frameworks is just use the, frame, the same framework that your company already uses. It may be that the new hot thing is Rapids, um, but your company already are, doesn't use it and they instead use PyTorch. Um, use PyTorch. Um, there's all these sorts of, there's all sorts of information about relative speed of any one of these packages, but when it comes down to it, use what's familiar, use what you have resources for, and um, then only then will you, will you consider um, moving on to a different package if that's uh, required. So why does multi-node work? Um, the sky's the limit in terms of compute power. You can access thousands of machines if you need to. Um, and so you don't need to, it, like you're not really limited in terms of what size data sets you can uh, analyze and hopefully how quickly they, um, they get computed. Um, frameworks often make this transition somewhat seamless. Um, so hopefully you get into a situation where you just have to change a couple of lines of code and you'll go from a single node to a multi-node. Um, and then most importantly, from my perspective is that scaling and auto scaling is possible. Um, so essentially what this means is that you can right size your compute to whatever the, um, the problem that you're working on is. So if you're working on a relatively small problem, you can turn the cluster off um, and work on your single machine. And then as soon as you need to get the um, sort of uh, get additional compute power, you can spool up a cluster, do that computation, and then spool it back down. Um, so that you're not paying for all the compute power all the time. Um, now, again, we've got to come back to some of the negatives of doing this. Um, and communication overhead is, is going to be the big one. So making sure that the machines are communicating efficiently. If you sort of naively just pass large bits of data from machine to machine, then you're going to find that there's major bottlenecks in terms of just the communication profile between the machines and not and you're not actually using the machines to their full capability. Um, and then again, coming back to use the single node for as long as you can, um, it's often easier and faster to, to develop it on a single node. And then it often runs more quickly on a single node as well. So I've just given you an awful lot of information um, in terms of what the solutions could be uh, to these particular problems, uh, both the memory and the speed constraints. So sort of in practice, what do you want to do? Um, and this is my particular approach. Uh, this has been informed by you know, a lot of experience in the data science world. Um, but um, essentially what I typically do is I buy my way out to start. So um, my laptop is rarely um, strong enough in order to, or fast enough or big enough to do uh, large data set calculations. So I'll move on to a cloud provider um, that allows me to scale um, into um, larger compute uh, servers. Then I'll typically make my data smaller. Um, so that usually involves summarizing and sampling. Um, when you make your data smaller, it allows you to iterate quickly. So I will typically use that smaller data set, do a couple of quick models just to make sure that everything's working, and then I can move up to a larger data set. Um, once I'm moved up to the data set, I'll start applying parallel computing. Um, and then optionally, kind of depending on um, where things land, I will uh, try multi-node parallel computing if it's required. Um, the important thing here is that in these steps of solutions, don't try to jump ahead. Don't jump directly to multi-node parallel computing just because it's the new hot thing. Um, it's important that you spend the time on the smaller data set, for instance, um, before you move on to uh, these other steps. So just to give you a sense of how this might work in practice, we're gonna review a modeling example. So in this particular example, um, I took a data set from the Free Music Archive. It, this particular data set was 42,000 30 second song clips um, that were each had a genre label. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to make a classification algorithm that giving a song clip outputs the song genre. Now, each song uh, in this data set had corresponding metadata um, and extracted features, uh, which made summarizing it a uh, step that was already done, uh, which was pretty fantastic. Um, overall, the data set was approximately 100 gigabytes compressed. 
Um, that's an important word there because oftentimes you'll see that your data set is only, let's say, 10 gigabytes in a zip file, but then you try to uncompress it into RAM and suddenly you're running into memory errors. Um, so make sure you think about the uncompressed size, not just the compressed size when you're looking at the data set. But still, 100 gigabytes was more than I could certainly fit on my laptop. Um, my laptop has 30 gigabits, gigabytes of RAM, uh, but it wasn't sufficient to analyze the whole data set. So, I applied those steps that I talked about earlier. I bought my way out. I moved from my laptop to Saturn Cloud. Um, I summarized and sampled the data. Luckily, the summarization had already happened for me. Um, but I took a sample of that summarized and of the raw data um, in order to do some quick uh, iterations. I used XGBoost for those initial quick iter iterations. And then I used DAST and PyTorch um, to do the full model run in the end. So um, here are the four main models that I ran. Um, I did a small XGBoost model that had a sample size of just 1,500 of the songs um, of the, of the, you know, the full 42,000 data set. Um, and that uses the extracted features that, that came with the data set. So normally I would go ahead and calculate these uh, myself, but because they came with, um, with the data, um, I just went ahead and used those. I then moved on to an XGBoost model that uh, used the full data set, but again, just used the extracted features. Um, and then from there, because I saw some progress, um, I started moving on to a PyTorch model that used the raw audio, uh, turned it into a MEL spectrogram, and then applied a vision model. And I'll talk about that in a second. But I did that both for the 1,500 um, uh, song sample size and for the 42,000 song sample size. So in the PyTorch model, what we did is we took this raw data, so the raw waveform, and turned it into a MEL spectrogram, which is essentially a representation of the, um, the amplitude of, of any particular frequency um, over time. And so that gave us essentially a picture uh, that we were able to put into a, um, a vision model um, that gave us a classification in the end. I found that this approach worked particularly works particularly well for audio files. Um, so it's definitely something that you can attempt in the um, if you ever run into this particular kind of data set. Um, but this is overall how the PyTorch model worked. So what were some of the results? Um, what we saw is that we saw an increase in accuracy going from the small XGBoost model, which again was working on the extracted features, to the large XGBoost. G boost model. Um, this is sort of what we would expect and what we're hoping for, um, that as we are adding additional data, uh, the model gets more accurate. Now we did go, we did see some accuracy increase, but we also saw some training time increase. So um, we went from an eight second training time, which is you know, essentially negligible up to a seven minute training time. Um, now this is, again, doesn't take particularly long, but as you can see, as the data sets get larger and larger, we might have more and more training time issues. Uh, these were all done on an eight CPU, 64 gigabyte of RAM machine. Once I've, I did this smaller analysis, I saw those, um, I saw the, the improvements. So decided to move on to doing a large, PyTorch model on the same data set. So using the raw data, summarizing that in a different way and running a more complex model on it. Um, the 1500 um, song sample uh, yielded a little bit better than the XGBoost small sample, um, but took significantly longer in order to run. Um, and then I moved on to a larger model, uh, I mean, a larger uh, sample size, so the full data set, so all 42,000 songs. And I did that both in single node and multi-node. And the important thing that you'll see here is that the single node took about 45 minutes, give or take. The multi-node took about an hour and 45 minutes. Um, that's despite having approximately equivalent uh, machine types. Now, there is probably something that could be done here. I saw that there was definitely some communication issues um, in terms of where the bottlenecks were um, in the multi-node um, the multi-node example. Um, so I think I could do some additional um, improvements in order to bring this time down. But the overall um, idea here is that going from this single node to the multi-node, um, it ended up being a, taking a lot longer in terms of doing the model training time just because of that communication overhead. The other thing which I didn't put in this particular slide is how long it took me to develop each one of these uh, particular models. Um, 
of the total time that I took um, building, um, you know, working on each one of these models, I'd say about 70% of the time was taken, was taken doing the PyTorch multi-node model. Um, this basically had to do with the amount of time that it took to debug. Um, you had to wait for clusters to turn up, uh, turn on and off or reset. Um, and then debug errors become a little bit funny. Um, you're not, it's not often completely obvious where the error is or, um, or you know, what it happened to be part of. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, that's going to be a, a major problem that you're gonna run into. So I probably spent about 70% of my time on the multi-node, maybe about 20% of the time on the PyTorch other models, and then about 10% of the time on the XGBoost model. So we saw definite improvements um, as we went from the XGBoost to the PyTorch. Um, you can see that there's a little bit of a difference here between the, the single node and the multi-node, and that's because of the way that uh, the random numbers are generated um, was a little bit different. Um, but again, um, we definitely spent a lot more time working on this particular example. Um, and then here's the confusion matrix um, for the XGBoost large model, just as an example. Um, and you can see where each one of the, uh, the songs was classified. We were very good at um, classifying rock songs, um, not quite as good at classifying pop songs. Um, and so there's definitely some room for improvements and some hyperparameter tuning that we could do to maybe make this model a little bit better. So what did we learn um, by doing this, or what did I learn, I guess, by doing this particular model? Uh, the first thing, definitely start small and iterate. We can see we had some pretty good um, results just from the small models. Um, and so that um, gave us sort of reasoning in order to move on to the large models in hopes that those would also be as effective. Um, the second one is combined strategies. So I combined by my way out, summarizing, sampling, all those um, in this uh, particular example. And that definitely uh, was what yielded the results that we got. Um, single node was fast and familiar. It was pretty easy to develop everything on the single node. And by just using uh, one of the larger machines possible, we were able to get uh, results that actually were an improvement over the multi-node example. Um, and then multi-node was tricky to debug. Um, I ran into communication issues. I ran into some other multi-thread issues um, because it was trying to do multi-threading and then multi-threading. Um, so it's just something you'll have to um, kind of work with as you're moving into those multi-node systems. Um, in order to uh, find the results. Still, we found that more data was better, uh, which is fantastic and shows that our approach was good. Um, so it was going from 1500 um, songs up to the 42,000 songs, we saw an improvement. So when I was actually doing this uh, particular analysis, there were several tools that I used frequently um, and I just wanted to bring to your attention. Um, the first one are progress bars. Um, they are incredibly useful for first, figuring out just how long something's going to take. Um, so for instance, TQDM for Python uh, tells you the overall estimated time for a loop, um, which is great for if you're you know, deciding whether you need to make it faster or not. And then once you decide to make it faster, how much better was that solution uh, in the end? Um, so uh, making sure that you're keeping track of all that. Um, R also has prog progress, which allows you to do a similar thing and just shows you where you are on the loop. Um, the other two major tools that I used were TOP and uh, NVIDIA SMI. So TOP shows you, if you just put this in a terminal and you just write TOP, it'll show you what all the processes that you're using. And then most importantly, what your memory usage is and your CPU usage. So what you're looking to do is you're trying to um, you know, keep that memory usage under your overall total, and then to get that CPU usage as high as possible. Um, and this will allow you to figure out where your bottlenecks are, what you need to do in order to, um, uh, or where you need to put your time in order to improve the overall outcome. And then NVIDIA SMI is the way of watching uh, NVIDIA graphics cards. Um, and so again, this has similar um, information to top. It'll show you the overall memory uh, usage of your uh, graphics card and then the utilization that you have as well. 